Fever, cough. Fever, runny nose. Fever, well, just fever. So, bah, let's just get a urine. This question comes up all of the time. Now, fever without a source is a big topic, but today we'll focus on the workhorse lab test in pediatric emergency medicine, the urinalysis. When should you commit to getting urine? When can you wait? When should you forego testing altogether? Trying to bob and weave daily through these questions may have you feeling a bit like you're in a video game. Jump, click, order, collect that urine, one up. Let's talk strategy and real life hacks for the times you get the sense of you're in trouble. You make tough calls when caring for acutely ill and injured children. Join us for strategy and support through clinical cases, research, and reviews, and best practice guidance in our ever-changing acute care landscape. This is your Pediatric Emergency Playbook. Welcome to the Playbook. I'm your host and coach, Tim Horechko. We're busy caring for patients. Algorithms are good. They help keep us moving things along, or they give us some sense of control in uncertainty. Sometimes, though, we fall into a rut. Things become routine, but could we improve our routine? Today, we'll use a frequently asked question format to tackle some daily dilemmas like, when do I get a urine? It's an easy decision in the verbal child who has signs or symptoms of a urinary tract infection. Or maybe you're investigating the well-appearing child with nondescript abdominal pain or vomiting. I think the real high-yield thing to talk about here is when to perform urinalysis to help explain a child with a fever but no obvious source of his fever. This in and of itself, again, is a huge topic, but let's go tangible here today. Today we'll stay focused on what we can call the ED fever consolation prize. You know the slogan. I went to the ER and all I got was this lousy UA. With every young child, we need to do a careful, thorough, head-to-toe examination. Many a young child's urethra has been assaulted because we didn't look hard enough to see the red-hot vesicles in his throat, his herbangina. Or maybe we didn't notice the fine viral exanthem on his back or his belly. Or we just didn't take the time to look under the diaper, spread the buttocks, and see the beefy red ring of a perianal streptococcal infection. We just got a urine. If a child has an obvious source for the fever, like a URI, for example, and you weren't concerned about a urinary tract infection, then why get the urine? Use your clinical skills. If you can find the source during your good exam, then you've pinned the tail on the fever. Okay, you have a good point. Anything is possible. Maybe we're unsure of the source. So do I need to check the urine now or can we wait? There are times when the child appears well, he has a low-grade fever, say in the 38s, and he's been febrile for just a few hours, or in some cases, minutes. The source of the fever may not be readily obvious yet. It is okay to forego urine testing in the ED as long as the child is well, he's vaccinated, he's over three months of age, and he's not at high risk for a urinary tract infection. There should be good access to follow-up, and the social situation should support that plan. A lot to consider, but think about it. Many children fall into this low-risk category. More specifically, and according to the AAP guidelines, if the child is well and you have no source of the fever, then assess the likelihood of UTI first before just reflexively getting a urine. Risk factors for UTI in children include a temperature of 39 degrees Celsius or higher, age less than 12 months, and a fever for more than 24 hours. Here's a common scenario. Mom and dad bring in five-month-old Sarah for a fever over the past hour. She's been fussy today, and when mom felt her forehead, she seemed warm. 
She is otherwise a normal, healthy, full-term infant with vaccinations that are up to date. On arrival, Sarah is fussy but consolable. Her heart rate is 130 and her temperature is 38.8 degrees Celsius. On exam, she's well, but you can't find a single source for her fever. Well, what's the reflex? Get a urine. But does she really need it? On the one hand, we don't want to miss a potentially serious infection in a young infant. More evidence is mounting that a delay in diagnosis can cause renal scarring. More on that later. On the other hand, is a urinalysis the cure for feverphobia? Well, I can only tell you what makes a UTI more likely or not. In preverbal children, look for fussiness, for GI upset and vomiting or other changes in behavior. Fever, of course, may be the only sign. I mentioned holding off on just getting a urine because Sarah has a common and relatively low-risk presentation. Yes, she is a young infant. That is actually her solitary risk factor, being less than 12 months of age. On the other hand, she's an otherwise healthy, full-term child over three months of age with a temperature under 39 and a fever of less than 24 hours. Really, it's only been an hour. With her only risk factor, her age, her probability for UTI is less than 1%. If she were to present with a higher fever, so 39 degrees Celsius or higher, or a fever of longer duration, greater than 24 hours, that may get us a little bit more excited. In other words, in this low-risk child with obviously very vigilant parents who and here's the main take-home, who is well-appearing. You may choose not to test now and ensure close follow-up. Here's the take-home point stated more generally, and this is a very conservative approach. Any full-term child who's well-appearing, no comorbidities, he's vaccinated, is greater than three months of age, he can have a fever in the 38s and he's allowed not to have a source in the ED. You may elect to monitor at home. Many of these children will manifest their runny nose, their cough, pharyngitis, or other viral signs and symptoms soon enough. Bag or cath? The short answer is, always cath, never bag. Now, here's the caveat, and this is my strong opinion. It's based on the evidence, but also on my style and approach. Now, here's the full disclosure first. There are children's hospitals that have a protocol for the RN to clean and bag the child in triage and whistle while you wait. The urine is produced by the time they get back in a room. Okay, now here's my pro cath rant. If you really need to know whether the urine is infected or not, the only way to know is through a catheterized specimen. Two reasons for this. One, a cath specimen minimizes the false positive rate. And two, you can send a culture to confirm or speciate if needed. Now, on the other hand, the argument for bag collection is this. If we clean the perineum really well and place a bag, it's not invasive. If it's totally negative, we're done. If it's positive, then we'll have to cath. Here's the problem I find with this argument. First, it's the idea that if it's negative, then we're done. Actually, the UA is only a preliminary test. Some urinary bacteria don't produce pyuria initially. The true gold standard for urinary tract infection is a culture. Even the most ardent of pro-bag supporters will concede that we can't use bag specimens for culture. So, at best, we're limiting our chances of catching a UTI. The second pro-bagging argument is this. If the bag specimen's positive, then we'll just cath. That way, we can decrease the number of catheterizations that we do. I would argue that if you're just throwing on a bag and seeing what happens, 
then you're probably over-testing in the first place. Sometimes what seems like tools of efficiency end up being monkey wrenches in the machine. Nevertheless, now you have a dirty bag specimen, and now you'll want to calf the child. It's a tough sell. The parent says, Can't you just treat the infection, doctor? You wince a little inside. Uh, no, you try to explain with some sympathy. We need to know for sure. Now, if that didn't make the family leave against medical advice, then the rest of the conversation never goes well. You're now making the argument from a weaker position. The family looks at you like you're nuts. Later, if the cath after bag is positive, you're met with a, well, that was a waste of time. It's hard to argue. If it ends up negative, the parents are so disgruntled at this point that they feel their consolation prize has been taken away. I went to the ED and all I got was this lousy UA. Open and supportive communication can help us through these bumps in the road, but the final argument is this. Now that the child has voided into the bag and you have a dirty specimen, you'll have to wait even longer for some urine before you catheterize. What could have been a few minutes of an in-and-out cath turns into hours while you're waiting for urine. In short, using bags in the clinic or in other settings, it's dealer's choice. They can always come to us in the ED if there's an issue. In the ED, we have to be more decisive. First, ask yourself, do I really need this urinalysis? If yes, then perform the proper test and don't fool around. Get the catheterized specimen. What is the definition of a UTI? Okay, so maybe the child has risk factors, or you're pretty sure you're going to find a urinary tract infection. And you ask yourself, Self, would I give antibiotics to this child if I find something? Would I believe the test? To get there, we need to know a little bit more about what is a positive urinalysis. According to the current clinical practice guideline by the AAP, the standard definition of a urinary tract infection is the presence of both pyuria and a culture that's positive with at least 50,000 colonies per ml of a single uropathogen. So that's nice, but how do we make the diagnosis of a UTI in the ED? The culture won't be available for a day or so. Also, the definition is not perfect. Some rarer cases show no pyuria initially, but they'll show a legitimate uropathogen on culture. The definition is sound in most cases. The logic is that you should be symptomatic and have a positive urine culture. So you see that the diagnosis of UTI based on your analysis is really only preliminary. It's not definitive. We need a culture to know for sure and to guide follow-up. Okay, that's all fine, but what do we do now in the ED? The presence of WBCs with a threshold of 5 or greater WBCs per high-power field is required. What else goes into the urinalysis that could be helpful? Leukocyte esterase is an enzyme that neutrophils make. It's a proxy for the presence of white cells in the urine. For UTI, it has a sensitivity of 83% and a specificity of 78%. Nitrites are not very sensitive in children for two reasons. One, not all pathogens produce them. E. coli definitely does, and so do Klebsiella and Proteus. But Enterococcus is a sneaky, sneaky bug. Enterococcus does not produce nitrites. It has two other shady friends who don't let you know they're coming. Neither Pseudomonas nor Staph saprophyticus produce nitrites. 
The clue to detecting these bacteria is that they're unusual. Enterococcus proteus and Staphs aphrodisiacus are often present in more complicated cases or in children who've been hospitalized for prolonged periods of time. Another reason not to rely on nitrites in any child is this. Nitrites take time to form, and young children just let it flow. It typically takes four hours for bacteria to convert nitrates in our diet to nitrites in the bladder. Children in diapers urinate all the time. They don't hold their urine long enough to produce nitrites in their bladder, which is why nitrites in children convey only a 53% sensitivity. If you find them, though, you're in luck. The specificity for nitrites for UTI is 98%. The presence of bacteria on standard urinalysis conveys a sensitivity and specificity in the low 80s. Well, that's usually all we have to go on when we're deciding whether to treat the child for a UTI. But many times we're in a position where we have an inconclusive or wishy-washy UA. Here is where the enhanced urinalysis comes in. The enhanced UA is just the addition of a gram stain to the urinalysis. It's old school, but it works. The only reason it's not so available is that it costs a little bit more money to do. Having said that, the enhanced UA is standard in our cash-strapped county hospital because of its test performance characteristics. A positive gram stain has a positive likelihood ratio of 87 in infants less than 60 days, according to a study by Diane et al. in Pediatric Emergency Care. That is, the fact that the gram stain was positive makes the likelihood of a positive culture 80 times more likely than if it wasn't positive. We rarely have such a rock-solid test characteristic in the ED. The enhanced UA is worth its weight in gold. If you can get it, then use it, especially in younger children where it matters most to have a prompt diagnosis. All right, what about all of the other things in the UA in terms of how they may be affected or not by a UTI? Urinary pH is all over the place, ranging from the acidic 4.5 to the alkalotic 8, because it's going to depend on our diet and our volume status, but it's usually slightly acidic. It only comes into play when you're thinking about stones. An alkaline urine suggests a urea-splitting organism, and that may be the harbinger of a magnesium ammonia phosphate crystal, which are the ones that cause staghorn calculi. An overly acidic urine may promote uric acid crystals. These are mostly adolescent and adult issues, but you may see this in a child with a known metabolic syndrome. Specific gravity also varies quite a bit from the dilute 1.003 to the concentrated 1.03. We just have to take it in context. In a child with vomiting who appears well, we can use the specific gravity of greater than 1.02 to indicate relative dehydration. Glucosuria and proteinuria can't be explained by an acute infection. Be suspicious of things like undiagnosed diabetes in glucosuria, or if you see proteinuria, think about intrinsic renal disease like glomerulonephrosis or glomerulonephritis. Things that could be either infection or something else include red blood cells, like in hemorrhagic cystitis, or ketonuria. It could be a sign of poor PO intake, or, of course, something like diabetic ketoacidosis. The UA is just a test. We have to interpret it in the context of the patient. 
Look also for hyaline casts and white cell casts. They may be signs of upper urinary tract involvement, like pyelonephritis. Which brings us to our next question. When can I just call it pyelonephritis? In an adult, we look for UTI plus evidence of focal upper tract involvement like CVA tenderness to percussion or for systemic signs like nausea, vomiting, or fever. It's pretty straightforward, right? In children, it can be a little trickier. I mean, if you look at a child wrong, he'll have a fever. So does UTI plus fever equal pyelonephritis in children? Not necessarily. It's for this reason that the literature uses the term febrile UTI for children. If this were an adult or adolescent, we'll just call it pyelonephritis. But in a child where fever is very sensitive but not specific, the diagnosis of pyelonephritis may only be made in retrospect with evidence of scarring on a radiographic examination like a DMSA scan. What I'm getting at here is that we don't have a clear delineation of when a febrile child with cystitis develops pyelonephritis. Look out for ill appearance or significant vomiting or tachycardia out of proportion to a mild fever. Older children may have flank pain or CVA tenderness to percussion. Be vigilant and if unsure, treat the febrile child with moderate to severe symptoms as pyelonephritis. How should we treat UTIs? For simple lower tract disease, so a child with a fever but he's otherwise well appearing, treat for at least seven days. There's no evidence to support 7 versus 10 versus 14. Here's my advice. Use 7 to 10 days as your range for simple febrile UTI in children. Pyelonephritis should be treated for a longer duration. Treat pyelonephritis for 10 to 14 days. Well, what should we give them? Bactrim or sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim is falling out of favor, mostly because isolates in many communities are resistant. In some places in the U.S., for example, the E. coli resistance rate is as high as 20%. It's also thought that children may be more susceptible to Stevens-Johnson syndrome with Bactrim. The truth is, almost any antibiotic can cause Stevens-Johnson's, but there do seem to be more case reports with Bactrim. We have no evidence comparing antibiotics, and this may be just a confounder since sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim is a common choice. Cephalexin, or Keflex, is my personal go-to. 25 milligrams per kilogram per dose, either BID or TID. It's easy on the stomach, it rarely interacts with other meds, it has a high kill rate for E. coli, and more importantly, cephalexin has good parenchymal penetration. That is to say, it works for a simple cystitis just like it does for upper urinary tract involvement. Amoxicillin, our favorite pediatric drug, works for most UTIs as well. One drug to avoid in my opinion, is nitrofurantoin, not for its safety, but for its efficacy. It is safe to use in pregnant women because the drug tends to concentrate locally in the urine. But blood and tissue concentrations are weak. My point here is that nitrofurantoin is a good choice for simple cystitis, but it has no real renal penetration. If this is early pyelonephritis in a child, remember we have a hard time distinguishing the two acutely, then we're just wasting time with an ineffective choice. If you think the child has true pyelonephritis on presentation 
and he is somehow well enough to go home and he has good follow-up, you can choose one of the few third-generation cephalosporins available by mouth. An example is ceftonir, given at 14 milligrams per kilogram in either one dose daily or divided BID up to a max of 600 milligrams. Just keep in mind that ceftonir is approved by the FDA for respiratory infections and it's off-label for urinary infections. All of this works for the child who is well, who is hydrated and taking PO, a good outpatient candidate. But whom should we admit? The first thing to consider is age. Any infant younger than two months should be admitted for a febrile UTI. Their immune systems and physiologic reserve are just not sufficient to localize and fight off infections reliably. The truth is, for serious bacterial illness like pneumonia, UTI, or severe soft tissue infections, be careful with any infant less than four to six months of age. I personally feel better when the healthy, thriving, well-appearing infant is greater than three to four months of age to be able to go home with antibiotics. At this point, he's better at localizing the infection as he's getting older. This is in line with the European guidelines, and honestly, I think it just makes good sense. Of course, the unwell child, whatever his age, he should be admitted. Think about poor feeding, irritability, dehydration, and in that case, just go with your gut and call it pyelonephritis and admit. What is the right age cutoff for a urine culture? In adults, we think of urine culture only for high-risk populations, such as pregnant women, the immunocompromised, those with renal abnormalities, the neurologically impaired, or the critically ill, just to name a few. In children, it's a little simpler. Do it for everyone. Who is everyone? To answer that, I'll share with you my rule of tens when it comes to UTIs in children. 10% of young febrile children will have a UTI. 10% of UAs will show no evidence of pyuria. As we talked about earlier, these are your enterococci, your Klebsiella, your Pseudomonas, or just your look of the draw. And finally, we should get a routine urine culture in all children with suspected or confirmed UTI up to about age 10. Once they hit prepubescence and adolescence, if the initial UA is negative, we'll catch them again if they continue to complain of symptoms. I think that this may be helpful for two reasons. One, in preverbal and younger children, this approach allows us to be more careful, more sensitive to the condition. And two, the other side of the coin, we don't need to send routine urine cultures on adolescents and adults. Of course, if there is some independent reason to do it, then do it. But just don't feel obligated if it's not needed. Well, what do I do then with the urine culture results? You may be in the position where you need to react to a positive urine culture. By the way, since this is a workflow issue, it's really your institution's obligation to have a mechanism for this. If you don't have one set up already, from a quality improvement and safety perspective, please consider making this a regular assignment to a qualified clinician who's not involved in regular care. Okay, so you get a call back from the lab, or you're doing your due diligence and following up on results. Do you see greater than 50,000 colony-forming units per ml of a single uropathogenic species? Go ahead and treat it. Go back to the record if it's available to you and check to see that that child is actually on medication from the ED. If the case was worrisome, you may want to call the family for a phone check. Let the results ride and see if it speciates. This may require a second check to see that the medication given is known to have activity against that pathogen. 
Again, another reason I like cephalexin is that being highly concentrated in the urine, children will still respond clinically to treatment even if the isolated organism is reported to have intermediate or sometimes a resistant flag. You can see that following up on urine cultures requires quite a bit of attention and diligence and some patience. Okay, so your UA is negative. Now what? Remember that the diagnosis of UTI may only be made on culture, and so far we focused on UTI in the context of fever. Remember, viral syndrome can cause mucosal irritation, including the urethra, giving symptoms of dysuria. But what about the other things in the differential diagnosis of dysuria in children? Think about non-infectious causes of urethral irritation, like from aggressive scrubbing, some parents just want to be sure, or from something more gentle like soap. Bubble bath urethritis is a thing. Some mothers of uncircumcised boys can get really aggressive with trying to clean under the foreskin. This can cause non-infectious irritation, or it can cause an infection like postitis, an infection of the foreskin, or balanitis, an infection of the glands, or both balanopostitis. Physiologic phimosis persists until age 3 to 5. No need to pull back that foreskin. Nature usually does its job. Also, a good word now may prevent a dangerous case of paraphimosis later. Pinworms or threadworms are our not so good friend, Enterobius vermicularis, the intestinal worm. The female comes out at night from the rectum and lays her eggs around the anus, hoping to send her babies off to the world, either directly through the anus or under fingernails in an unexpected scratch and release. You may see excoriations around the anus, and you may see the pinworm itself. If the symptoms are consistent, I just treat. It's a public health issue. If you're not impressed, you can have them do a simple test and follow up in clinic. Despite all of our advanced technology, this one is as low-tech as it gets. At bedtime, the parents firmly apply cellophane tape to the anus. In the AM, they take it off and inspect for worms. Remember also to look for retained toilet paper. Look also for labial adhesions. Unfortunately, we always have to think about sexual abuse. Other things that predispose children to UTIs include not urinating frequently enough, especially for little girls who may be shy to use the toilet at school. Perhaps the child had previous instrumentation. Think also about incomplete hygiene. Little girls, as they're learning to toilet train, have to be patient and coordinated. Younger girls may also explore and leave a trace. Constipation is a big one. A stool-filled rectum can cause incomplete voiding and stasis by compressing on the urinary outlet. And lastly, again, unfortunately, especially in young girls, UTI from wiping back to front. Approach this in a delicate way. We don't want to embarrass mom or anyone else. Sometimes preschoolers have better things to do. They're busy. After they go, they gotta go. What kind of follow-up should the child get? The younger the child, the more we worry about missing a decompensation. When our patients have access to primary care, I empower the parents to call the office as soon as it's open, or that same day if they came in during business hours, and just check in. I want them to let the office staff know about the ED visit. It may be a good opportunity to help them to reconnect, to catch up on screenings or vaccines. It also reinforces their own role in their health care. A friendly recommendation to check in with the office underscores the need for an ongoing relationship with their pediatrician or family practitioner. It turns out 
we can't be all things to all people in the ED. After good return precautions, even if I think the care in the ED is enough to take care of the problem, I always tell parents that your doctor wants to see you. He wants to know that you're in the ED and he may want to see you sooner than he would otherwise. Who needs imaging? All right, you've done your due diligence. You've assessed the risk of UTI. Maybe you've even treated it. Good return precautions, and you've repatriated the child back to his primary care. What does he need later? It's good to know these things, again, because of potential gaps in communication. Perhaps the pediatrician would never have known about the ED visit even months later on a routine checkup. Also, parents have so many questions for us sometimes. It's nice to know the plan from here, even if we're not the ones to follow through with it. The idea behind imaging in UTI is to pick up previously undiagnosed anatomical abnormalities. Before we go into Should we get one as an outpatient? Let's briefly talk about what we would be looking for. First, the big one, vesiculo-ureteral reflux. Here's the deal. Your ureters should plug into your bladder posteriorly at an angle. You would think that's all there is to it, but it's actually a complex, delicate area, including multiple layers that interweave into each other as the ureteral lumen passes through and joins into the bladder lumen. A physiologic valve is created when the bladder muscle contracts. It closes off the small inflow from the ureters because the ureteral opening is surrounded by muscle. Unless you're unlucky. If the layers of adventitia, smooth muscle, and mucosa don't line up properly, then when the bladder contracts, urine is propelled forward out the urethra, but can also be pushed back up the ureters if there isn't a good seal at the ureteral vesicular junction. There are specialists who devote their careers to this subject, but let's just say for our purposes— Urinary reflux back into the ureter is not uncommon in children with UTIs, and it can cause trouble down the road. Conversely, the ureteropelvic junction may be too tight, causing UPJ obstruction. This is often diagnosed in older children or young adults with hematuria, UTI, abdominal mass, or pain. Beware of the young person who has abdominal pain out of proportion to the UTI. More often, though, UPJ stenosis or obstruction is found in infants born with hydronephrosis, and they're promptly diagnosed and managed. A ureterocele is a cystic mass in the bladder. It's not malignant, but it does cause ureteral dilatation and hydronephrosis. Treatment of a ureterocele is surgical. A child may be born with an ectopic ureter, or even duplication of the collecting system, where one ureter drains into the northern hemisphere of the kidney while another drains the other side. More parts, more problems. In boys, an ectopic ureter can insert in the bladder neck or even in the epididymis, causing infection inflammation, or just misdiagnosis. In girls, the ectopic ureter can insert in the cervix or the vagina. If there's a concern for this, the child is sedated and the urologist performs a common-sense screening. He places a Foley catheter in the bladder and a cotton ball in the vagina. He then fills the bladder with dye. After a few minutes, he inspects the cotton ball. It should be wet, but not dyed. Otherwise, there's an ectopic ureter. Beware of neuropathic bladder in children with spinal cord disorders like myelomeningocele or spina bifida. Look for sacral bony defects, for pigmentation around the sacrum, odd dimples, or a tuft of hair. Posterior urethral valves only occur in boys, and they're a bit of a misnomer. 
they're actually not valves like you would see in a vein to prevent backflow. Posterior urethral valves are the most common type of congenital bladder outlet obstruction, and they're just extra folds of the membrane in the lumen of the prostatic urethra. Usually, ablation by cystoscopy is the way that they're fixed. And lastly, we should be aware of the possibility of a uracal remnant. At one point, your anterior bladder wall and mine was connected to our belly buttons by a duct. In later fetal development, it's no longer needed and regresses in fibrosis. If it doesn't, you may see a newborn or infant with a constantly wet umbilicus, or just Frank leaking from his belly button whenever he cries or strains. In older children, the uracal remnant may become infected and he may present with fever and an umbilical mass. So you can see that screening for these things is not emergent, but we don't want these children to fall by the wayside or develop complications. The short answer is, tell the family that their pediatrician may want to do an ultrasound or other test after this infection. The AAP guidelines currently call for a screening renal and bladder ultrasound after the first UTI, looking for hydronephrosis mostly. If that's negative and the child improves, usually no further workup is done. If the child has a second UTI, the recommendation is to go for the more definitive test, the voiding cystourethrogram, or VCUG. Some call it the micturating cystourethrogram, or MCUG. The child will get some anxiolysis or sedation, and a bladder catheter is placed and dye is injected into the bladder. The radiologist uses fluoroscopy to see how the bladder fills. A normal VCUG just shows the bladder. An abnormal VCUG shows varying grades of reflux up into the ureters. It's basically a cath report for your bladder. Renal scarring may be detected by a dimercaptosuccinic acid scan or a DMSA scan. It involves injecting this radio-labeled substance intravenously, waiting for renal collection, and performing a nuclear medicine scan to detect poor uptake, indicating renal scarring, usually from previous pyelonephritis. Renal scars can be a major contributor to hypertension later in life. So, with all of this testing, are we overdoing it? Like anything, it's a balance. A few tips to avoid iatrogenia by way of a summary. First, if a child over three months of age who is well with no comorbidities has a low-grade fever in the 38s, especially if it's less than 24 hours, you are very safe to choose watchful waiting at home. More to the point, if you see an otherwise well child with an obvious upper respiratory tract infection, then boom, you've nailed it. What will the urine prove? If your little patient has risk factors for UTI or you're otherwise concerned, send the UA and send the culture. You can opt out of the culture by middle school in the otherwise healthy child. With any other relevant comorbidities or history of UTI or anything out of the ordinary, it's just fine to rule it out and get that UA. But please don't feel obligated to just get a urine on every child in the ED. And finally, deputize parents to carry the ball from here. The child needs ongoing primary care and his pediatrician may elect to do some screening. Don't promise or prime them for it. Rather, encourage the conversation. Before we go, a brief word on a few urine collecting techniques that may be helpful to you. First, an oldie but a goodie, the suprapubic aspiration. 
It really is the criterion standard for collection, and it was performed all the time back in the day, but in and out caths are pretty good and not as invasive. But if you have a child with severe labial adhesions, or phimosis, or hypospadias, or you just need that urine now, here's how to do it. Use the ultrasound to verify that there is urine and the bladder is where you expect it to be. Old school landmark approach is fine, but there was an unacceptably low success rate in the mid 60s to low 70s before ultrasound. Now with ultrasound, we have a nearly 100% success rate. Ideally, when the decision is made to do it, place topical anesthetic cream while you gather your supplies and rally the troops. Let's talk supplies. This is a sterile procedure. Use a mask and sterile gloves. You'll need betadine or chlorhexidine to clean the skin, sterile ultrasound prep, a 5 ml syringe, and a 23 gauge needle. Just make sure it's the longer version. If not, you can use a 22 gauge pediatric spinal needle. Now, here's a good tip. Have the urine specimen container open and ready. The reason for this is that as soon as you take down the diaper, you may see a geyser. If you can catch a midstream sample, then life is good and you can all stand down. By the way, since the likelihood of spontaneous urination is directly related to how much you mess with a child, if you're going to do a bigger workup, then this procedure should be done before labs, before LP, before anything else, or your liquid gold may be spent somewhere else. The next big tip is, like an LP, you'll need a good holder. He or she should not be related to the child. Kind ruthlessness is what we're going for here. Wrap the child's upper body in a bed sheet. Hands to the sides, wrap the sheet around a few times to help stabilize and avoid flailing arms. For older toddlers or children, tell them you're wrapping him in his Superman cape or wrapping her in a princess gown, whatever works for them. At best, they'll let you do it, and at worst, you can take advantage of their stunned confusion while they wonder, what is this guy talking about? Okay, are we ready? Let's go in. You're in sample cup, ready and open. You're standing at the child's side, at the level of his pelvis, facing his torso. Your holder has one arm over your baby burrito at the torso, and one hand hovering over the ankles, ready for a dragon grip. Taking down the diaper, we clean the skin. Use the ultrasound again, but now in your sterile fashion to visualize the bladder. You should feel the full bladder just above the symphysis pubis. Your 23 gauge needle is on your 5 ml syringe. Under ultrasound guidance, you puncture the skin just above the symphysis pubis at a 10 to 20 degree angle off perpendicular directed cephalad. So to visualize, if you were to point the needle directly at the bladder, it would be exactly perpendicular to it. The needle is angled 10 to 20 degrees in the cephalad direction, so pointing away from you. You advance the needle without aspiration until you reach the urine, then aspirate. If you aspirate too early, you'll mix the sample with a small amount of blood in the subcutaneous tissues and muscle. Take your sample, withdraw the needle. Gauze over the small puncture for a minute. Now, this may sound a little barbaric if it wasn't what you were trained with, and it is a bit old-fashioned. But take heart, this was done all day every day in the past. Think about it in the scheme of things. Suprapubic aspiration is a lot easier than holding the child down for an IV and actually more comfortable. The target is huge and if you plan accordingly, you'll get it on the first try. It's a satisfying procedure and it may save the child, the family, and you a lot of headache if you just do it. Okay, one last special maneuver. This one's not so invasive. Small infants do well with this midstream clean catch technique, first described in neonates. Herreros Fernandez et al. conducted a study in four hospitals in Madrid. 
They enrolled 90 consecutive infants, less than 30 days of age, who needed a urine sample for any reason. Here's how they'll tell you how to collect a clean catch from little babies. Step 1. Feed the baby, wait 20 minutes. Step 2. Clean the genitals with soap and warm water and dry with gauze. Have your sterile urine container open and at the ready. Step 3. One person holds the baby under his armpits with his legs dangling. The other person gently taps the bladder, then massages the lower back. So that's 100 taps per minute at the bladder for 30 seconds. Like this, tap, 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 tap for 30 seconds. Then a gentle circular massage at the lumbar paravertebral area for 30 seconds. Step four, get that clean catch. You can't overdose on this, so you can always repeat the process. In the study, the mean time to sample collection was 57 seconds. Median time, so the exact midpoint of the values, was 45 seconds, with an interquartile range of 30 seconds. In other words, 75% of the samples ranged from 15 seconds to 60 seconds. So be ready with that collection container. There was a 100% success in all 90 subjects in this study. This neonatal clean catch method is a good one for the child with a fever who is not critically ill. Try it on older infants as well. It only takes a minute and it may save some aggravation and discomfort. Waiting for urine may be time well spent or part of a broken routine. Think about risk factors, alternative sources of a fever, and do your best to balance caution with reason. Thank you for listening. Remember, until next time, you are the champion for the child in front of you. Take care. Thank you for listening to The Playbook. We welcome your comments, questions, and feedback. Email Tim at coach at PEMplaybook.org or drop by our website for show notes and more strategy at PEMplaybook.org. See you there.